This video is on concrete properties. There are two essential ingredients in concrete. One is Portland cement and the other is water. These two ingredients interact chemically in a process called hydration. So the water actually becomes incorporated in the final chemical composition of the hardened cement. Hydration is the mechanism for hardening of the concrete. Therefore, you should never say that the concrete hardens by drying. Don't talk about concrete drying. In fact, the last thing you want to do is have the water escape because if you have the right amount of water to begin with and you allow the concrete to dry, it will weaken and it will cause cracks and diminishment of the strength of the material. Portland cement is fairly expensive compared to all the other components we might use in concrete. It also generates a large amount, large amounts of heat of, in the hydration process, which can create severe stresses in the curing concrete, sometimes causing severe cracking and severe structural damage. Because of the two issues above, we almost always add to the concrete mix materials that are inexpensive and chemically inert. We call these materials aggregates. The most common aggregates are sand, gravel, river rock, stones, fly ash, and lava rock, for example, if we want to make a lightweight mixture. So we go to a light aggregate like lava rock, which is porous. <coughs> there are many others. Um, but this gives you an idea of what the list is like. We commonly mix different sizes of aggregate with the goal of maximizing the ratio of aggregate to Portland cement in the process producing a less expensive and superior concrete. We try to avoid aggregates that are large enough that there is risk that they will not fit between the reinforcing steel bars. And by the way, with regard to the issue of mix mixing different sizes, Imagine that you started with a bunch of baseball sized rocks and you pack them in in the densest pack configuration that you can possibly imagine. And then when you look closely at that, you discover there are voids between those baseball sized rocks. And those voids can sometimes be filled with river rock or gravel or for sure with sand. So what we usually try to do is use a blend of aggregate size, which as we say is to maximize the ratio of aggregate to Portland cement, which saves money, reduces the issues having to do with the heat of hydration, and actually produces a superior product. <coughs> we always try to avoid adding any more water than is necessary for hydration. Any unhydrated water creates voids that are major stress risers in the hardened concrete. Concrete with just the right amount of water for hydration has historically been very stiff and therefore difficult to place. This is one of the great challenges and always has been for concrete that especially when the concrete is mixed and then brought in a truck to the site to keep it properly fluid and to make it possible to place it after delays and getting it there, often extra water gets added. And in fact, the vulnerability of the uh, construction crew to having poor concrete delivered to them is so high that there uh, is a test for it, which we'll talk about in a, middle, in a minute. Getting stiff concrete to everywhere in the formwork and between the rebar often required adding extra water, which creates weakening voids or using vibrators, which cause separation of the components of the mix, causing parts of the concrete to be weaker. Historically, we have used something called a slump test, which measures stiffness of the mix, which is an indicator of potential strength. Lower slump, generally corrugate, correlates with less water and stronger concrete. This is what we've historically dealt with 
and we use this slump test at the site so that we don't place bad concrete in the formwork that's weak concrete because some desperate truck driver knew his concrete was hardening in the back and gave it an extra shot of water so that he could get it to the site and deliver it. This is a, a classic sore point between the concrete suppliers and the builders of the building and the slump test has been the way they've found to work around that problem. In recent years, additives have been developed for concrete called super plasticizers. These additives are much more effective than water in making the concrete flow better and they do not diminish the strength of the concrete. If the aggregate does not get too large, such concretes flow almost like water, finding every remote part of the formwork and finding their way between any rebar in the structure. The, sl the classic slump test is turned upside down for any concrete in which these super plasticizers are used because the slump test will indicate they're not very stiff and, and uh, without an understanding of the role of the super plasticizers, the slump test is basically worthless. Or the other way of looking at it is, if you do the slump test, it's to verify that you got all the super plasticizers that you paid for and the slump test will create this big old slurry that spreads out like a pizza piece of pizza dough. Okay, <coughs> for concrete we have two primary parameters. Uh, in the case of steel we talked about yield stress. In the case of concrete we use a symbol F sub C prime, the C meaning compressive failure and F standing for stress or sometimes people say C stands for crushing. Uh, either way you look at it, this is in this table given in pounds per square inch, PSI, and we're told that 2,000 PSI has a crushing stress of 2,000, 8,000 PSI has a crushing stress of 8,000. Uh, we sometimes call these 2KSI, 3KSI, and so forth. Um, so you need to be nimble in terms of making sure you read the units. And I'll just repeat what I've said many times before. If you don't get the units right, you have the wrong answer. So the very first thing you want to start with is in units. <coughs> in the case of steel, steel has only one material stiffness regardless of all these grades. Concrete is more complicated. Concrete has a variable stiffness. Uh, again, it's in pounds per square inch and you'll notice the stiffness goes up and it goes up like the square root of these numbers here. Uh, so it's not as pronounced a variation. We're only going from 2.5 to 5.1 as opposed to 2 to 8. But still, this is a very significant issue and it's one of the things that makes uh, dealing with concrete in an analytic way really difficult. Another thing that makes concrete really difficult in terms of stiffness analysis is that <coughs> in the tension mode, the concrete cracks and all the tensile stresses are taken up by the steel. So these numbers right here are not very meaningful in terms of that aspect of the behavior. So the behavior is immensely more complicated than is the case for steel. And the one comment I will make is that the concrete industry has struggled mightily over the last three or four decades to find simplified ways to do their analysis. Uh, and some days I feel like the steel and the concrete industry are going in opposite directions. The concrete industry understood that they had very complex issues and are trying to simplify the design process. Some days and don't get me wrong, because I love steel, uh, but some days I feel like all the design issues that are being raised for steel are making it uh, difficult to design a building and get it out the door. Okay, now uh, I will note here that in the city of Raleigh, you typically will have three PSI for 
for uh, footings that are perhaps oversized because of bad soil conditions. Uh, 4K PSI or excuse me, 4 KSI or 4,000 PSI is is generally the common grade. Every once in a while you can get 5 KSI or 5,000 PSI, um, but usually somebody's eyebrows go up when you say that. <clears throat> um, on the other hand, it's not uncommon in Chicago where they have really great aggregates and they have a wonderful infrastructure for delivering concrete. It's not uncommon to be able to buy 10,000 or 12,000 PSI concrete. So these numbers are extremely variable. I went up to 8,000. The Burj Dubai is slightly over 8,000, which by the way, the Burj Dubai is a two component mix or three, I should say. It's got water, Portland cement and fly ash. That's it. And they managed to punch, pump that in a single stage to the top essentially of the world's tallest building. If you ignore that little picayune 50 story steel tube at the top. Um, so there are, it's possible to get really exceptional grades, particularly if you work in a part of the world where you have excellent aggregates, a really excellent infrastructure, and you use all the modern materials like super plasticizers that are available today. <coughs> okay, so concrete does not work very well in tension. Typically, its tension stress is at best 10% of its compression capacity. Um, so we put steel in concrete. This is a classic uh, rebar grid for the bottom of a spread footing. You'll notice that we don't bother to weld these things together. We wire them together because the bonding of the concrete is such that the concrete really helps to hold everything together in the final analysis. And these wires are mainly there to make sure it doesn't move around until the concrete has had a chance to cure. These steel bars are measured from the small uh, dimension across here. And these ribs that are on here uh, are there to enhance the uh, pull-out capacity uh, in the concrete. So in other words, it's really hard to shear off these ribs and, and they're designed to be just the right size so that that almost never happens. Okay, so the other kind of rebar or reinforcement that we typically use is steel cable. So this is a casting bed where I think these are double T's, but I'm not sure. Um, and this steel cable has been hydraulically um, pulled out to about 180,000 pounds per square inch. And it moves a lot in doing that. So we almost never use this kind of cable in a concrete structure without pre-stressing it or post-tensioning it. So the next uh, set of slides kind of illustrate what that means. I've got some little styrofoam blocks that I made and I drilled a hole through it and ran uh, some uh, rubber bands that were looped around each other. So there are several rubber bands in here. And when we go add a weight, this is what happens. Uh, basically we get large amounts of movement and cracking in the concrete. The concrete tolerates very little uh, fractional deformation. <coughs> The steel cable, on the other hand, does fine with that. It says I'm super strong and I can go to unbelievable amounts of elongation, even though I'm also much stiffer than you are um, because I'm so much stronger than the concrete, I can undergo huge amounts of fractional deformation. So what we can do is we can post tension that. Uh, and so what you see here is you see a little rod there of plastic and what I've done is I've pulled the rubber band through. So in here I, I had, you know, three or four bands of rubber band and I've pulled one of them through and that was just enough to raise this thing up again and make it work as a post tension structure. And now I add one more of these weights and it deflects again enormously. 
And the rubber band is really not feeling it too much at this point. It's basically saying, hey, I could do this all day long. And that's pretty much the attitude of steel cable. I can stretch as far as I have to stretch. Uh, and I can wear out any of these other materials. So what I've done now is I've pulled another link of rubber band through and then pushed the rod through to make sure it doesn't collapse. And I've pulled it back up again. And uh, now I do it one more time and I pull out another piece of rubber band. I do it one more time and I pull out another piece of rubber band. So this is to illustrate to you what an enormous amount of movement there is in the steel relative to the concrete. So in this case, we're representing concrete with styrofoam blocks. We're representing the steel cable with rubber bands. And I like that analogy because steel cable is kind of like the rubber band of building construction, except of course, it's immensely stiffer and immensely stronger than a rubber band. But compared to the inability of all the other materials like concrete to undergo these large deformations relatively speaking steel cable is kind of like the rubber band okay so that concludes some really basic stuff on concrete properties um, and we'll move on to our next topic